Hello there. My name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. With so much of the world now open to travelling sea anglers, and with so much opportunity to get a floating fish for just about anything anyone could ever wish to catch, it's unusual to find someone that's willing to travel internationally on a regular basis to fish, then channels all his efforts into doing so from the shore, with, it has to be said, some quite spectacular results. That man is Whitley Bay match angler Ken Robinson, who is going to talk us through the prospects, timing and whereabouts for some of the very best shore fishing locations around the world. But before we get into the real nitty gritty, explain the fascination of foreign shore specimen hunting and how that came about, then give us a flavour of just exactly what can be achieved and to what extent this has captured your imagination. Obviously with the fishing sort of deteriorating around here, in fact one's expectations started to grow a little bit. I spent a lot of time in Ireland and looking for all sorts of things, sharks and big stuff either shore, boat, wasn't really perturbed. Anybody that would take us fishing really, and certainly the tourist port there, were quite good when we, we worked with them for some period of time. But it was exposure to likes of the Canaries and getting into the States and Iceland and places like this that opened my eyes up to what was actually available and, and really, I guess, makes the, the fishing here for codlins and things fairly mundane. The quality of fish that you can encounter and not too difficult to locate yourself at reasonable cost. Uh, I've had some brilliant fishing. Canaries have, have produced things for me that people dream of. Um, I've had Dorado off the shore, I've had sharks, I've had jacks, all manner of different species, things you haven't seen, things that are in strange colours, things I still don't know what they actually were when they were landed and it's open to everybody really. I've approached everything from a, a personal perspective and in fact most of the places I've been I've, I've actually taken the wife with the exception I think of, of Iceland. We've done it together although she doesn't fish very often these days at all. It's quite feasible to easily plan a trip and be successful in catching fish. There's enough information out there on the internet etc that enables you to uh, at least focus in on an area. Whether you're successful or not when you get to that particular area is a, a different matter and certainly my experiences of the States would suggest that sometimes you do have to put a little bit of effort in first to locate how, where and when to fish because it's completely, utterly different to the, the, the sort of fishing that we do in this country and uh, the opportunities are there in terms of it being accessible to everybody, travel's easy, costs not so bad these days, although flights can be a bit prohibitive. Big issues, I guess, with carrying your fishing gear, that can sometimes cause problems. Yeah, I've had a few problems myself over the years, something hopefully we can look at in a little more detail later. Getting back to the fishing, though I'm not a shore angler myself, I have done a bit here and there, and in particular in Namibia where I was a member of a party that took what at the time was considered to be the best shore caught haul ever made, with well over £15,000 of fish in five days taken from an open beach. But that was fishing with a guide, Johan Berger, who was absolutely fundamental to our achieving that. So would you ever consider using a guide, or is the main thrust of the experience going out there and doing the whole thing for yourself? It is a balance between the two, to be quite honest. My fishing experiences abroad really started when I was still working. They were concentrated into a, a matter of, I guess, that month when probably two to three weeks of it would be spent going somewhere distant. I was also on a reasonable budget in terms of not being able to afford to spend too much. And when you consider the price of a, a guided day or a trip in the boat these days in, in the likes of the States, it totally prohibitive. I could spend, I think it was something like 400 quid for a day's fishing in a boat with a guide. That 400 quid would actually pay those days probably the flights out to the States. So it was a consideration that I didn't really make. I prefer 
actually finding my own way around things and, and certainly I, I've got sufficient experience these days to enable me to do that to a large degree. But if you're looking for a shortcut to success, it would certainly pay to use a guide. Now, if you're going as I do with the wife, it tends to be fairly prohibitive. But if there's two or three of you going, there's no reason why you don't have that, at least that first day, guided. And it'll give you a wonderful oversight into what there is, how to fish it. And in some cases, if you do that for a week, there are opportunities to actually get some reasonable prices. And I certainly know friends of mine who, they go to the Bahamas virtually every year, and they always do it on a guided basis. Uh, and they're always very successful, but it doesn't really come cheap. And certainly my future at the moment, the places I've got on my list of need to go to suggest that I'll be doing it on my own because I have a knowledge to a degree. And I think the successes I've, I've actually achieved without a guide enable me to, to do that without too much fear, I don't think. When you're fishing on your own, how do you manage to handle some of the bigger fish, if or when they come along? <laughs> With great difficulty, to be quite honest. It's a strange one, but in the last sort of three or four years, I've been across on the Keys quite a few times. I was there last year twice. And about four, four years ago, I actually had a, a fish of about £100, which I'd had on for a while but on very, very, very light tackle. And I'd taken it to this particular area. I'd always been fishing off a, what is actually a, a sort of a, a bridge support. And it's a long concrete base that runs along for about 300, 400 yards to my left, it would have been. And it, it gets you into shallow water. So I had a, a shark on, which I'd had on this rod. Taking it all the way down, trying to get it into a position, because I'm trying to get it videoed at the same time, and I get it into the shallow water and I get down into the water with it um, and attempt to lift it out, I've, I've got a hold of. At least I've got one hand on its tail now and I've got the line still tight to its mouth and attempted to lift this thing onto the, the drier rock. And of course, an immense strength these fish have got, really. The, you underestimate them and unfortunately, the fish kicked. I dropped the fish and I probably didn't have sufficient line from the real the rod tip and certainly it didn't have the drag set I just had it as tight as possible to keep control over the head of the fish and it dropped smashed the rod I did actually get the fish I didn't get it out of the water I had to cut the trace in the end and strange enough I think it was beginning of last year when I was out there I did exactly the same in exactly the same place <laughs> how could you do such a stupid thing so that cost me two rods in two sessions about four years apart similar sized fish about a 90 100 pound shark which had taken probably about 20 minutes to land on this very like the shakespeare rod that i had but it as you say it's very difficult the other real problem i've had fishing on my own and even when there's been people watching the invariably there the tourists tend to spot you when you get a, a decent fish on but the number of big tarpon i've had on and the struggle i've had to try and land them when you're on the shore, you, you don't have that flexibility of being able to follow them with the boat. I, I don't know how many I've lost, to be quite honest, over the years, because you get a, a fish in excess of £100 off the shore. It's extremely difficult. You, you, I've never landed one over 100 and I've had them well, well over that. So <laughs> the answer to your question is, it's bloody difficult at times, because you don't know what you're going to catch. Depending, of course, on where you're going, transporting tackle with you, or as you've just mentioned, breaking it while you're away is potentially going to be a major headache. Some venues, such as the US, where tackle is not only readily available, but also very cheap, means you can travel light, or replace items when they're broken or lost. But going to somewhere such as, say, Namibia in West Africa, where you'd struggle even to find anything, you're going to have to take everything with you, which can seriously eat into your baggage weight allocation. Most of the flight carriers, the airlines that you're using, are on about a 23 kilo baggage allowance that's not too bad and most of the places I go for pleasure fishing these days are hot weather places and as a consequence you need limited clothing I've got that down to a fine art I, I tend to take as little as possible in terms of clothing so I end up with a, 
at least 15 kilos of fishing gear as a capacity and it, it's not too bad but you've got to make that list out before you go. The problem is that it's not just your fishing tackle actually it's the other things that you need to, to carry with you as well to protect yourself when you do get to these places. I mean I have a major problem with the insects and I need to be well supplied with insect repellents so all these little things sort of contribute to that weight situation. In previous years it wasn't so bad when the likes of uh, BA and those would carry your fishing rods as a, a full length tube and they wouldn't increase your baggage costs. That was great because you didn't have those particular weights included in your bag. But these days when it's, I think the last time I was caught was about £60 a trip to take a rod tube. As a consequence, I've now geared it with a whole range of proper travel rods, quality travel rods, uh, multi-piece, five, six-piece rods that fit into the bag in rod tubes on their own. They run out at around about sort of two kilos once you've got the, the rod tubes on it as well. But because I've I've got a variety of them, what I've found is there's a number of the rods that I can get two rods into one tube of the short length so I can comfortably carry four rods in my bag. The only problem is, of course, if your bag's have a problem with the carrier, as mine did going into the States via Paris this uh, past sort of autumn there. I lost bags, both the bags actually disappeared in um, in Paris and I didn't get them until a couple of days later. You're knackered without your fishing gear. It's, <laughs> you may as well cry, it's terrible. But other than that, it's quite feasible to get most of the gear you want into your, into your bags. Um, everything needs to be tuned in terms of not carrying big boxes and bags that weigh heavy. A lure bag that's of lightweight construction, not a one that's got a great heavy bottom on it um, and not lots of plastic inserts, etc. It's trying to optimise everything that you're carrying down to lightweights, but obviously when there's a need for heavyweight lures like jigs and leads as well, it's a, a case of trying to to work out how you're going to actually fit those into the, the actual carrying range that you've got. Because remember, you've got your clothing that you can carry as clothing, like a fishing jacket. Don't put it in your back, put it on your back. It can go into the, the locker above your head. You can put stuff in your pockets. Your hand luggage, you have a good limit on that. Invariably, they don't weigh that anyway. So you can go over a little bit on that if necessary. And you can put stuff in, in those hand luggage bags. But be careful what you put in those hand luggage bags because I got collared with lures in it. I bought some good lures on the way back out of the States one year. We are very late going through. They pulled me up and I had to discard all the lures out of my, my bag. They were big, expensive ones, but just put that down to experience. Sometimes, for whatever reason, they don't like reels in the bag with the line. Don't know. Uh, I've never experienced that, but I know the people who have. Um, so it's a case of identifying heavyweight things that you can put in your hand luggage that aren't going to cause a problem and invariably it's not too difficult I think to get a, a balance and keep under the, the weight restriction and take all your fish and tackle but obviously if you're going to a colder climb it's a, a different perspective that you're going to have to think through how you do it but there are ways and means of reducing everything down to a minimum to maximise your fishing gear because that at the end of the day even if I'm going on a family holiday, generally it's um, focused on catching fish at the end of it. So I must have everything that I need to go fishing in this particular venue. I found, particularly when I've been fishing in America, where they have Walmarts just about everywhere, that it can actually be cost effective to go light on either the claws of the tackle, buy what you need there, then leave it behind afterwards. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I've done that. It's not unusual to get a a big grin out of a, um, one of the handlers at the, the car hire place when you bring the, the car back and you, you're getting the stuff out of the car like the, the seat that you bought for the wife so she can sit while you go off and fish and hand those over to him. Sometimes it's a good diversion actually if you brought it in you've got a little scratch on it somewhere give him a rod that you can't get into your tube or a, a seat or a, a few whatever's you've got lying around the back of the car hand them over to them and it's very cost effective at times because um, as I said earlier, the number of rods, uh, let's think, I've 
broken three in the last four years. Uh, one I stood on, two I, I snapped by trying to lift fish, and I lost a, a very good rod and reel in autumn in the um, on the keys when I, I had just put the rod down, hadn't set the clutch properly, and it just disappeared. It went off like a rocket across the surface and disappeared before I could even get anywhere near it. So I lost another rod and reel in, of course. Fortunately, I, I'm carrying three or four rods anyway, minimum, so I didn't actually need to replace that one. But in the previous years, I've always purchased another one. Um, I purchased a reel when I was there, but rods I've purchased. Unfortunately, a lot of the rods that you're buying out there, if you're buying something that's, uh, say, seven foot long, eight foot long, then invariably it's one piece and it, it, there's no way you can get it home, so you may as well just give it away anyway. And that's what I've done in the past. The other point is that by hiring in the services of a guide, you don't have any of the tackle problems or transportation costs you've just mentioned. Um, well, as I said before, I, I tend to do my homework, and whilst I think you, you can really get a good idea what sort of tackle you need for most venues these days, there's very few places that you're going to go to on your own that haven't been fished before, because it's usually the, the fact that you, you're away that certain species of fish or certain quality of fish are taken in these sort of locales at these particular times of the year, um, then you should have a very good idea of what sort of tackle that you're going to take. Why I've got a range of very good travel rods that would suffice for, for most species with the exception of, I guess, absolutely monumental off the shore. They're there, you can carry your own. You have much more confidence in something that you know. Uh, nothing worse than going... And actually, like, <laughs> you must remember going out in boats where uh, the gear that they supply is absolutely horrendous. Nothing worse. Yeah, I've done some where the gear has been absolutely battered. It's not just battered. I always remember going out in a boat out of one of the Canaries. I can't remember which one it was. But anyway, they'd, we'd gone out. I thought they were going out trolling. I'd taken my gear with me. I had a boat rod. And as soon as I realised what they were doing... I decided I, I wasn't going to do what they were doing. They'd been presented with marlin rods. They had rods with the, must have been 120, 140 class rods, big reels on. They had a three-way boom on, which was completely metal. God knows what depth of water they were fishing in. And it turned out they were bottom fishing and they were fishing for small spur dogs. And it was taking them for a long, long time to get to the bottom and then reel back up again. And I thought, well, if that's the sort of fishing, you know, the, it was, wasn't particularly expensive. It was a very good boat, very good gear, but the wrong type of fishing. Um, I fished off the back of the boat for sharks, put my gear together and just fished off. I didn't get any, but I give it a go. I wasn't going to fish the bottom like that. Crazy. Can you now talk us through some of the more outstanding shore fishing venues you've turned up to date? My interesting sort of journeys into unknown territory really started with easy options of going to the Canaries. The first sort of islands I think I went to were, were Lanzarote and Gran Canaria and I, I think I've circulated those islands in the vehicle looking at marks and, and fish in various areas. Virtually the, the whole length and breadth of those, those islands. My favourite place really of the lot was uh, Arrecife in, in Lanzarote. Arrecife Pier itself, which is one where you could actually used to be able to drive on, gave you access to a lovely depth of water and on certain tides when the, the tide was flowing away from you, gave you the opportunity to put baits into the water, live baits in the water and the quality and the, the volume of fish that showed up in that flow of water was, was unbelievable. Plenty of tuna now and again. I've actually seen hammerheads moving through there, certainly caught bonnet heads, lots of the, the big lease there. Are. The type of mullet the Canarians get, big fish around the sort of 10 pound and the number of rays, absolutely horrible things to catch in terms of when you get a big one on, there ain't much you can do with them, but certainly some of the, the smaller ones have landed. Most of those islands, though, the, the Lanzarote and, and Fuerteventura as well, some of the rock edges give you really good access into relatively deep water, nice tidal flows, 
and again they, they hold a lot of bait fish and the opportunity is to get bream like fish very close in on uh, light gear bread baits is quite often very feasible very easy to catch float gear very close into the side some big mullet around a lot of these harbours in all these places Ventura has a, a number of sort of rocky points very similar to the, the sort of ground here in terms of what you're actually fishing off rocky ranges that they give you access into a, a reasonable depth of water but the bottom itself seems to be fairly harsh in terms of rock and weed and holding quite a lot of the food fish but very accessible the thing that's spoiled the canaries in the last few years is that the majority of the um, the piers and the breakwaters etc there's been a, a clamp down on the fishing and a, a bar on the fishing which is a a bit disappointing because they, they do have some absolutely wonderful access to some really fishy ground and it holds a lot of fish move through. In fact, one of my best experiences ever in terms of the quality of fish I've ever caught uh, was catching a couple of Dorado dolphin fish off Arrecife Pier early morning, one morning. Absolutely superb. In fact, it probably ranks as more or less one of the best fish I've caught off the shore whilst they weren't massive certainly good fish in excess of 25 pounds so it's always been an attraction for me to go back there and, and try it out although I, I haven't been back there for a few years tuna off Ventura itself again quite consistent live baits, floated baits sometimes and with lures works very well in very good sport early mornings, late evenings works great from there I've tried all over the place, but Iceland's another one that sticks out in, in my mind as, as being absolutely superb potentially for both short and boat. Boats, probably, I guess, some of the best boat fishing I've ever seen. I just couldn't believe that we were catching fish, haddocks of sort of 10 pound and catfish, the 20 pound. And it, it wasn't isolated instances of, of these sort of fish. There were shoals of haddocks and shoals well, a shoal of, of catfish. I've never known uh, where the majority of people were catching catfish in a session off a boat before, but certainly that was unbelievable in, in terms of boat fishing. Rather than the pollock that we get here off the shore, in Iceland you, you're more likely to encounter big coal fish, and uh, certainly this year I'm hoping to, to get a, a decent double from over there at least. And certainly one of my target species is to get a, a halibut off the shore. And certainly that's another uh, little target that hopefully later on, when we get into the summer, and have a little bash over there. Iceland is quite a sizeable place. So what about specific locations? Well, for Iceland, I happen to know the, the guy who has the trips organised out there. And Stevie used to live near me here in, in Colour Courts. Uh, and, and as a consequence we're going over to stop with Steve and he's going to guide us around he's, he's fished it for probably the last 10 or 20 years he's a commercial, he's into the fishing over there has been since he transferred from here and has fished a hell of a lot and he knows what we're after he knows we don't want to go and fish for codlins and get the old stock fish from, from over there but he's been telling me of what he's been encountering lately and, and certainly there are opportunities to get some pretty good fish. I'm not too confident about getting the halibut from the shore, but certainly he's going to put a bit of effort in before we go out there to, to see if he can locate anything. But he's certainly got a, a whole wealth of, of different spots that he knows will potentially fish. And uh, we've targeted the north and the, the east of, of Iceland to have a little foray during June. So that should be quite interesting. I guess my focus for the last sort of 10 or 20 years really has been the States and um, started with Florida Keys and was um, a, <laughs> a difficult baptism to start with, I guess, because my first journey into the US was a one that was, I think, more based on optimism than anything else. And the cheap flights that were able or available to us at the time from Newcastle 
were ones in to the area near Disneyland. We flew into Orlando. Well, anyone that's been there knows it's a long way down on the Florida Keys. And in a, I think it was probably just over a two-week window, we went on spec, never been there, hire a car, drove down the, um, the Gulf Coast and drove down onto the Keys and got us sort of as far as Isla Morada and experienced some interesting fishing there in, in the, the, the first ever journey. Sights that I saw were just unbelievable. I just, the opportunities it posed, the fact that you were seeing fish tartan in, in amongst the uh, the boats that were moored up, except they were just lying, hiding in the shade, and there were rays of sort of, oh, must be been 100 pounds, coming up virtually the surface of the water, foraging for bits of fish that were being thrown in, just opened one's eyes. And whilst there were some nice fish taken on that first trip, since then it's been absolutely phenomenal in terms of basing myself generally in the centre of the Keys at Marathon and then travelling out depending on tides, conditions, fishing all different marks. The shore generally, although I have had a number of trips out in the boat, gone out with the party boats to try that, have a little look then. The odd trip out in the boat with people I know down there. The quality of the fishing can be superb, uh, but it's all down to experience. If I hadn't, I guess, been to certain places at certain times and been successful, I guess I may have written those off because there are certainly numbers of places that look extremely good that I've been to and not caught fish on, but I've gone back and tried them at a, a different stage of the tide and found that uh, I'm into fish that are beyond anybody's dreams at times. Um, certainly fish of £100, not unknown, and fish that fight, that's the key driver when you go across there. Fish that are going to really test your tackle, test your knots, test your ability to land fish, because these things can move and it's quite difficult at times to actually turn the fish. In fact, you get to the stage where you've got to decide what baits you're going to use because it, there are a number of sharks about. If you start catching the sharks, you spend too much time. They tend to get laborious after a while in terms of something that's on there that you're struggling to do anything with. And there are always, unfortunately, things in the water that these fish tend to head for. Similarly with the rays, the rays are just like a big wing that's just driving off and they just keep going. And there are times when you do, in fact, I've seen fish that are sort of moving through in front of you, pick your bait up, although you can't see the bait, but you you know, you surmise it's that fish that's gone through. Pick your bait up and just starts running with it and you're just stood and your reel starts to strip. And it's a decision, well, am I going to turn it? Mm, uh, so you just have to put the clutch down and, and snap it off and hope that it uh, doesn't take too much line. But there are species like jacks, absolutely wonderful fish to catch, and they can show up for lengthy periods of time and they can show up in big numbers. And you get a double-figure jack on light gear. Well, even on, on heavy gear, <laughs> you know you've got a fish on. There are times when I've had some big doubles on and they, they just kick their tails and they just take line and they're just screaming off. Similarly, I've had snook. Um, occasionally, you fish fishing areas where you get big snook, they can pick you up and they just head for the, the nearest bolt hole, straight under a pier, a jetty, or into some rocks. And it's not unknown to lose quite a few fish. Going up the Gulf Coast, I've fished a number of different places. But Sanibel Island was quite an eye-opener. It, it, different sort of fishing to um, the Keys, although certainly some similar tactics. There were a lot of sharks about, a lot of sharks, a lot more than I expected, certainly. And there was a lot of snook. In fact, at times I could see the snook feeding beside the pier. There was a lot of bait fish in the water, and there was a, actually there was a, quite a, a lot of dolphins about. And the dolphins, I think, were, were obviously feeding amongst all these bait fish and things. And every now and again, you would get quite a few of them come up alongside the beach. In fact, there were people sort of wading on the beach and the dolphins would come in amongst them and come around there. But the number of fish you would see were, was unbelievable. And I fished up here quite a few times. I had a 
a fish beside that. And, uh, not sure whether it was a, a nurse shark, but it was a, a fish of about 150 pounds I had on. Again, on a very light rod. And it was just a case of keep the drag set properly and eventually the fish will give up. It'll give and it did, it came in, I got it in okay. Obviously just released it and, and let it go. But there were black tip sharks in there using the Spanish mackerel for bait and small ones. Just chopping the head off those, you guaranteed you were going to get a shark on every time. It wasn't too bad with the small with these black tips, uh, but they would jump out of the water and they took your bait. Once they felt the line, they would jump about the water. It was, it was quite interesting. I'd expected to see a few tarpon shown, but the, there wasn't any tarpon down there at that particular time. But there was a lot of snook, and uh, they were getting them round the, the base of the pier that you're talking about. And they were showing up all the time. Quite often they were fishing though with some horrible gear. They were fishing with big, heavy boat reels. Uh, the other thing about that was that Apparently there were resident Jewfish, the giant groupers, the Goliaths underneath. And every now and again, when you're fishing with the live baits for the, the snook down the side, you'd get something which must have been them. You just didn't see them and it just, there was nothing happening. It just, that was it. It was gone into the, the bottom. Um, there was a guy came along and he had a tuna which he'd cut in half and it was probably about, I don't know, about eight pounds and he'd cut it in half. Had his big boat gear and he'd come fishing specifically for these goliaths. But I never saw him hook into one. That's certainly where they, they get a lot of, of big goliaths around that sort of area. I've seen some interesting videos of down there. And uh, I've quite a few groupers around that area. It was at the other end of the island, I think I was, when I got an area where there was a bit of sea wall that held quite a few groupers. They weren't goliaths, they were small sort of three, four, five pound but they were, they were good fun on very light gear quite interesting but there's fish, encountering fish all the way up the bridge road that comes over from the mainland which is probably about a mile, two miles long that set of bridges across and a lot of the locals fish on there and you get a lot of fish fishing from the base of each of those bridge supports it's all flat area, you can actually ride a bike round them because that was my little exercise in the mornings was to cycle over the bridge and back and round all these things and see who was catching what after I'd been fishing in the morning and that's when I encountered this moronic guy who was in fact he'd been there a couple of days because I'd seen he had a one of these um, trailers with obviously slept in and when I got up to him he had a fish on the ground and it, it was in excess of 250 pounds lying on the ground a, a big shark beside his van and it was still kicking and I had a he had a discussion with his big Hispanic character suggesting why he should put it back and this moron suggesting that he was going to eat it and I uh, suggested, well, what are you going to do with 250 pounds of horrible shark? I don't know, but no, it was dead next time I passed him, so it was an experience that uh, shouldn't really happen. But I, I, I fished a lot of places up that Gulf Coast, trying different places, but... Last year, I decided that I was going to go, I've been promising myself for a long time, to go up to Cape Cod. I'd actually wanted to go and fish uh, Montauk. And whilst I'd read quite a lot about it, and I'd read quite a bit about sort of Cape Cod, I'd looked at what I could get in terms of accommodation in that sort of area. Now, when you look at things on the map and you read about things in, in different um, internet sites, it all looks fairly close to each other and it doesn't look too far from anywhere sort of thing, you know, in terms of New York's here and Montauk's there and Cape Cod's here. Well, it turns out that Montauk's probably 100 miles up the, um, the peninsula north of New York and Cape Cod's over 200 miles from New York. But I made the mistake anyway this time going in via New York and having to drive up and I, I went to Cape Cod by what an eye-opener that was lovely area beautiful area for fishing this year i'm going in september and i'm going in through boston and i'm going to have a month there what i planned to do was have two weeks in cape cod and then fly down to the keys afterwards for a month but after i'd had the, the sort of the two weeks in cape cod i'm bearing in mind that i'd lost my, my luggage and lost two days fishing at the start of the trip so I'd, it was now down to about 10 days fishing in cape cod 
when I had to leave, I was a bit peed off because I obviously, whilst it was, I was looking forward to the keys, I wouldn't have minded another week in Cape Cod and less time on the keys, but fishing Cape Cod, early mornings, it's just unbelievable in terms of the fish that I saw and the, the fish that you had opportunity to catch. Cape Cod has a huge length of coastline. We were based in the Chatham area, so which specific areas did you actually fish? Well, I had a look around all the beaches and I tried bits and bobs on the beaches, but I, I majored on the canal after I'd seen the canal for the first time. Cape Cod Canal is probably about 68 miles long. It's about, I would suggest, about half a mile across, something like that, widthwise. has a phenomenal tide going either way. Strangely enough, it doesn't coincide with the actual high and low tides, which is something else you've got to get used to. But the banks of the canal are large rocks, boulders, and as you get down with the tide, it's all dense weed along the edge. Depending on how far you cast, obviously, you're definitely chucking into 50, 60 foot of water, at least, if not more. You get major liners coming through this canal, so it, it takes a, a really big boat. And it, in fact, it takes the warships when the warships would go through. It's part of the reason, I think, of cutting off the headland. But it's quite difficult to stand at times. You've got to be cautious about how you sort of clamber about the rocks because there's a reasonable rise and fall within the canal itself. But what you do get, though, you, you get a, a lot of species running through there. And the primary species, obviously, are the striped bass. And the, the striped bass are beautiful. They're, they're monster fish in there. They're, there's uh, plenty of fish in the sort of 20, 30, 40, 50 pound mark. And nine times out of ten in the morning, you'll see lots of them. They're surfacing. They'll come right in towards the side at times. The sort of key thing is, is understanding where you might encounter them at any given time. So it's understanding the tides, it's understanding the conditions, and it's actually positioning yourself. Because you, you've obviously got two sides of the river. There's a, a service road, which you can't drive along, but you certainly cycle along on both sides of the canal. In fact, you can get right up to the, the entrances. Certainly on the left-hand side, you can get right up what are the, the sort of the estuary entrance to the, the canal itself. You can get along the rocks and you can actually fish either on the beach or back into the, the canal. And the, there's fish moving all, all along here all the time. They get the big tuna come in, apparently. They, I didn't see any, but I was told when I was there that they'd seen the odd one breaching. And you're talking about these big blue fins, the big, I think it's the blue fins that they were, they were getting through. But, you know, you're talking about 100 pound plus and the hammerheads running through. And they get all sorts of other species in there. Most of my fishing was restricted to using lures. I didn't get a chance to do much bait fishing. I had read that they were having a lot of success with live freshwater eels. And apparently they, they import the, the freshwater eels from Canada. And the first thing I did, of course, was I always go in when I go to the States with a, a live bait bucket with a, an aerator, etc. And I, I keep a a stock of live bait for the keys. Always got that going back of the car or wherever I'm staying. I have at least one or two buckets going with aerators on live baits in, so I was prepared for it up here. But I tried the eels. I had no success whatsoever with the eels, and I saw nobody else fishing with them. But they do have good success with those. And I'm of the opinion that the bait fish, obviously that the, the stripers are feeding on, if you can get amongst those, get some of those, I, I have seen no reason why a floated one of those or a, a free-lined one won't take fish. And I'm, I'm going to have, certainly have a look at having a go at that next time I go back. But when I arrived there, the first day I went down, as soon as I got my gear after it had <laughs> reappeared from the airline, I went and walked along the canal with the gear. And I, I spotted a guy landing a fish, a little Asian guy with his wife and... Watched him for a little while. He obviously he's having a little bit of a, a problem with his fish. And eventually he gets it aside. Wife goes down with these clamp things into the mouth and lifts it out and drags it up the side. And he has a fish in excess of 40 pound first fish I had seen come out. And it's a fish, must have been plus 40. And uh, had a look at his gear and he's got a, a jig on. And just a, a bucktail jig. 
white bucktail jig big, probably about oh, about four ounces, I guess that one was. Big white bucktail on it. And I uh, watched him for a little bit longer and he got a few fish, of course. One thing I didn't have were any big bucktail jigs with me. I had plenty of lures, rapalas and things like that. So I persevered. This was in sort of mid-morning and uh, I wasn't successful that day. But by the next day I had plenty of jigs and went back with the jigs. Unfortunately, the day I went back with the jigs, they were catching them on the surface with the lures. So I was a bit more successful, but I still didn't have the right lures. So it's another learning curve. It's all good fun in it. I've certainly got a lot more lures now that are right for that particular venue. And I've no doubt next time I go, I'll catch fish, but I'll learn a bit more. And hopefully this time I'm going to get my big fish. I think the best morning I had, I had a, a nice morning one day fishing on the surface, the fishing with Rapalas. I had about, I think it was 10 fish. Nothing massive. Double figures was the biggest. Really good morning. Plenty of sport. And every morning after that going down, as long as you're down there before it got light, virtually guaranteed to see fish and, and actually have the chance of sort of hooping into something. So what are the right lures? And can you get them over here to take at least a few with you to get you started? Well, obviously the jigs are quite important because I, I did see a few fish over the period. The jigs seem to work better during the day because the jigs, obviously, you're fishing them on the bottom. So you're bouncing them around with the tide. You do lose a few, so you've got to be cautious. But I think they're a bit... Because the fish go down during the day and feed mid-water on the bottom, then a jig, anything from sort of two ounces, maybe a little bit more up to sort of six ounces, maybe, for the really big tides. But just bouncing them around and just trying different parts of the canal work very well. Small lures, well, I say small, <laughs> um, sort of three inch up to six inch. Um, Sibelius, they work very well. And there's a lot of... Um, what I would suggest are, are, are sort of designer type lures. They're wooden lures that float, that look as though they're there to catch the angler rather than the fish, but unbelievably they work and they're, they're some strange pink coloured lures, floating lures that they use. Obviously I went to a few of the tile shops and tried to, to sort of gain some information from them as well, but sometimes I've drawn teeth in some of these places. The other jigging type lure that they use is a one that is on a lead head and it's an eel tail and I can't remember the exact name but they're an eel tail which is about 10-12 inches long and they use a nose in a black or a white I guess it emulates a, a freshwater eel now why a freshwater eel wouldn't catch more than a, a lure that, that sort of shape I, I don't know but they seem to be quite productive at times and they're very very popular with the local anglers I had fish on them the only trouble with using that sort of lure and I used big shads big heavyweight shads sort of four ounce shads three four ounce big clear ones was that there are a lot of bluefish in there and you get a bluefish anywhere near you your soft lures I certainly I went and I bought a, a few because I saw they were successful I bought a a few packs the first cast with one a big one and I mean it's about six inches long it came back and all I had was an inch of head left it had missed the hook and it just chomped straight through one chomp and it had gone it's an expensive way to fish one question that needs to be asked here is that for the first time visitor with little or no prior knowledge what sort of features would grab your attention across the whole range of venues and what might ultimately persuade you to give one a go in the keys you're looking for somewhere you can't see the bottom because a lot of the area is very, very, very shallow from the shore. And whilst you can see fish, quite often you'll see, and that's part of the interest of going down there, is that you actually see masses of natural life in the water from manatees, sharks, rays, all sorts of things just sort of flash past you. But if you can find what you need to find is an area that you've got a vantage point that's safe, flattish, sometimes on the, the coral rock formation that they put in to sort of protect the, the edges of the, the islands. Find an area that you can't see the bottom and you've got a good tidal run. What I found on the, the south end of the Keys, towards sort of mid to south, you do better 
on the tide running into the Gulf and fishing from any of the marks where you've got a good throughput of water and whilst it may not be very deep but you can't see the bottom invariably you'll get fish running through that always the same like that but when you get north of Marathon you can fish both sides very successfully and again don't fish off the bridges that's I think one of the fallacies of, of fishing the keys uh, there's only I think I'm trying to think there's one bridge I actually fish off and that's called No Name Bridge, which is actually halfway between Marathon and Key West. It's off the mainland and you drive through the deer forest. There's wild deers all over the place, these little miniature deer. And you've got another bridge, which I think is, is parallel with the, the main road bridge, but it's probably about two miles from the, the road bridge. And it goes on to No Name and it's a bridge over an expanse of water which is shallow on both sides and a nice deep current up the middle and that is the place to get your bait fish and also it produces a phenomenal amount of fish I mean it's always got I've never been there and I haven't seen tarpon in there but you get all sorts just about every species that you'll get on the keys you can get in this particular channel there's permit in there there's everything but it's guaranteed you can't go there and not get bait fish there are bait fish in there of different species at one time of the year or no. Um, the, the pinfish are there all year round. And if you've got pinfish, you can catch virtually anything on the keys with a live pinfish. I mean, I've had the big flounders on pinfish. Going north of Marathon up towards my Isla Morada, both sides, it's just a case of fish on the side of the main road, depending on which way the, the tide's going fish with the tide not against the tide the fish will run with the tide because the worst case scenario is you fish on the side with the tide coming towards you the fish quite often will go with the tide and go straight underneath the bridge that you're fishing adjacent to and you'll lose that fish there are times though that, that if you know the area well and places like duck key around that area if you're fishing there sometimes you can actually fish slightly away from the bridge in the channels, there's a channel that runs virtually the, the whole length of the road by any island. There's a little depth of water that runs along there and the fish run that channel. And sometimes fishing against the tide in those channels can produce tarpon, can produce jacks. And sometimes you get a concentration of the fish in there, but invariably it's a case of go and see if there's bait fish around. If there's bait fish around, there's a very good chance that you're going to get something from that. And are you fishing these baits on the bottom or suspended under a float? Most of my fishing is either free-lined, depending on what I'm fishing. When I'm fishing for tarpon, I fish free-lined, totally, with a live bait fish on. Or sometimes, you can, obviously you can get live shrimp, they call them shrimp, I call the big ones prawns, they're, they're big. Um, if you can get the big shrimps and fish those live, they're good for the tarpon as well, they, they, they're very successful. But live shrimps will take virtually everything as well one of the popular formats for putting a bait rig together is a simple rolling single lead ball a reasonable trace of your, your, your main lines whatever you're fishing for you want to target maybe 30 40 pound if you're fishing for the tarpon that's sort of the biggest i'd ever go to but generally i'm i'm fishing sort of 20 pound with a bimney on fishing a swivel a lead and a decent hook and you obviously you, you, you focus your hook size on the species that you're fishing for and you, you, you just a very simplistic approach to it live baits again fishing them either free line totally or free line with the lead the jacks will take a, a leaded one so they'll sniff it out it doesn't matter what kind of species of fish you've got on if it's a small fish and the jacks are about they seem to forage and, and pick anything up off the bottom no problem at all whereas the top and you tend to need to have the mid water you need to have your live baits swimming and swimming as fast as possible actually seems to turn the, the top and on do you have any little anecdotes worth throwing in at this stage the year before last i was fishing at bahia honda it's actually a, a national park down there nice area and it's got the old 
Flagler Bridge for the old railway that used to run down on the quays. But at the far end of Bahia Honda, there's a an area under the bridge, and it, it gives you access to a channel. It, it's one of my favourite marks, and it fishes extremely well. And it can fish on uh, all sorts of different tides, so I do spend a little bit of time there when I go down. And I've been fishing for jacks, and I had a, a few, quite a few jacks, fishing two rods, picking them up. And what you do is, because you're about three foot above the water, not too far, if you get a good fish on, you've got to kneel down and get a hold of the, the leader, because obviously you've got a, a fairly thick leader on him, maybe he's about 40 pounds and lift the fish up and I'd, I'd been catching a few fish and I'd had this one on and it had been kicking about and they do churn up the water a bit and it was about six pound and I was sort of kneeling down went to grab the trace sort of not looking at the fish just grabbed a hold of the trace and as I went to lift it out of the water I got soaked don't know what type of shark it was it just came in and wolfed this thing down and was gone I just couldn't believe it absolutely unbelievable enough seen them i've caught them but this was obviously a monster it's just swallowed a six pound fish and was gone unbelievable just hit my feet plus the fact it wasn't that long ago not the same trip i'd got my favorite lure caught up on uh, the bottom about 30 yards out so i'd just gone in swimming in swam off and went and released it and came back so uh <laughs> think twice about it since doing that sort of thing unbelievable I, I remember a few times where I've been uh, in the winter which is I find the Florida Keys November December probably the best months to fish down there to be quite honest but um, the party boat at Marathon the Marathon lady has a, a berth at the back of the shop in a canal that runs off the main channel and the, the canal's probably 10 yards wide maybe it's a bit more a little bit more, not much more than that. And they land the boat, and obviously it's dark in the winter when they come in from their afternoon sailing, and they fillet all the fish for the, the punters on the boat. And I'd come along just to have a look and see what they'd been catching. And they were throwing the carcasses into the water, and there was lots of pelicans on the water, and I was just standing at the video camera going, and all of a sudden I saw this sort of thing in the water didn't take a lot of notice but I just knew there was something there in the water I looked and I watched and then again I saw another movement and it was a sort of dark shape in the water and there's lights on the um, the cabin that they're, they're filling all these fish and uh, within a matter of minutes there's about three or four of these big bull sharks just circulating in there and they're, and they're, they're sort of every time a, a carcass goes in there's one of them will come across and grab it and obviously by now there's there's about six of these things in and I, I reckon the biggest must have been four or five hundred pound at least that sort of size crazy and they were coming literally to the side we were on a lower platform that sort of went down to the water level and uh, you could actually touch the fin as the fish were circulating and they would just come in and one of them would grab it and then they were, they were sort of two or three would converge every time something went in they would converge and the pelicans were on the water and they would just move out the way as these fish came in but they weren't bothered by these these sharks the guy that that was the the mate on the boat had, had come down and he was a bit drunk i remember him getting one of the boat rods and, and put one of these carcasses on and actually i don't know whether he actually had a hook on but he certainly the fish took the bait and he was sat on the front of the boat and given uh, Everybody will laugh with this this fish attached to the other end. Obviously, it just disappeared. On the subject of amusing shark-related Florida anecdotes, I was once over at Budden Murray's Marina on Isla Morada looking to catch big sharks and stingrays, which, as you've just described, came in amongst the boats after dark to feed on fish carcasses dumped at the end of each fishing day. Now, for those that don't know, Budden Murray's Marina has a sort of a rustic appearance to it. Its walkways are built of timber, fixed to wooden posts driven into the ground, which unfortunately is a combination offering a lot of potential snags when hooking big fish after dark. One particular evening, Graham Pullen hooked up a big lemon shark, which then proceeded to tear off all over the marina. Eventually, when the trace did come in and looked likely to take off again, Graham wrapped the wire around one of the wooden posts, 
and as the shark tried to run, the wire quickly tightened to the point where it couldn't be freed. At this point, the fish went absolutely berserk and looked in danger of wrecking that particular section of the marina. So unable to free the trace, Graham quickly legged it back to his room. Fortunately, the next morning the shark was gone, thankfully leaving no signs of what had gone on, so nothing was said, though we still laugh about it even today. Actually, going back to Graham Pullen, I remember the, the time we went to Ireland, and uh, surprisingly, that was the first time I'd ever had a go at, at shark fishing. I was remember, did I have the rod and you had the tackle? Or you had the tackle and I had the rod? I think I had the rod. Would that be the Cork Sherry trip? That's right, the Cork Sherry. Well, strange enough, you know what? Th- that exposure to him and his expertise at, at shark fishing stood me in good stead for my sort of forays into, well, Ireland was a, was a lot when we did a lot of fishing down there and uh, certainly into the, into the channel. But I learned there was a few things just by uh, watching him and knowing how he actually approached the whole thing. Because if you remember, he was the most successful in the boat and I was watching and I understood why he was the most successful in the boat and I translated that later in life to um, the number of times I went there because we did a lot of sort of shark fishing down off Mayo and, and around sort of different parts of Ireland. And I was always the most successful in then, and that was because I'd watched him, and there was a few things that he did that I learned, that I, I used, that other people weren't using, and I'm more or less guaranteed that I was going to get the fish if the fish were around. And nine times out of ten, that worked. All those years that I fished for them, it was, it was good. Which then, out of all the venues you've already fished, do you rate the best? To be quite honest, you know what? The next venue I fish is the best one. I've fished extensively now on the Florida Keys and that's because it's safe, it's easy. I've had some phenomenal fishing times down there. I've caught some wonderful fish. I've also had some drought days down there when I've experimented and and tried to catch fish from various locales and and haven't been too successful. But I've always been able to manage to catch fish sometime during the period I've been on the Keys. My latest option about going back to the the Cape, I think, offers a lot of opportunities to catch something very, very big from the shore. And it's relative, well, <laughs> we see it relatively cheap, but a flight to Boston from Newcastle is not too bad. You can go via London and it's cost effective. But the fishing, the attraction of the potential of fishing over there is absolutely immense. I've obviously got a few targets in mind before I get too old, hopefully. Anything in particular? Or to put it another way, what's your favourite aspect of foreign shore fishing and why? The quality of the fish. Absolutely the the quality of the fish and the fact that I can go fish safely. I can fish in good weather and there are fish that I'll never ever experience here in locations that offer not only a wonderful fishing aspect, but invariably there are wonderful elements of sort of flora and fauna that you can can see in these places. The the things I've encountered in terms of wildlife is absolutely brilliant when you you go around these places. Things I would never ever dreamt you would see, you know, the the manatees. I've actually danced with cormorants that have dodged around my feet. I've had herons stealing bait from the bucket, I've had skunks coming up, I've had raccoons stealing bait and it's something new every time you go somewhere you you find something new and you see things that as an angler you see things that other people wouldn't see because you're on the water at strange times and uh, you couldn't want to go anywhere better than the likes of the Florida Keys or up the Cape Cod and know that you're going to have a wonderful time and you're actually seeing these interesting animals and experiences that you never forget. That's the good part about going to these places. I've read there are locations in Australia where it's even possible to hook up marlin from certain rock ledges. (laughs) Strangely enough, it was one of my target areas. I did actually, well, I I save and collect old fishing tackle and, and I got a contact Um, with a guy who was working in Australia 
who had been fishing exactly where you're suggesting. It's a place called Jar. It's well, it's not actually Jarvis Bay. It's the promontory of rocks that stand at the entrance to Jarvis Bay, the Jervis Bay, as it spelt, on the the South Wales coast. It's an area that produces some wonderful fish, absolutely wonderful. And he sent me pictures of, of big GTs, and there are all sorts of marlin within casting distance of the shore. It's an unbelievable venue. But I guess it had been lucky enough to pick the right time, pick the right conditions, and approach it with the right tackle, because obviously fishing from the shore for specimen fish of that nature when you're in a, in a position where you can't move very far, is a hell of a challenge. I've been successful with some, unsuccessful with others, but I'm always open to finding new challenges like that. And that certainly was one of my target venues, and hopefully within the next 12 months, I'll be in Australia, and uh, I've got that penciled in for a week. So if anybody's got any other wonderful suggestions that are safe, and uh, reasonably accessible and can be approached similarly and we more than welcome to try it on. Time to pin you down now for everyone else's benefit. Nominate the location which from a big fish perspective you would put at the top of their must fish list. It's a hard one that one. <laughs> to be quite honest I think RSCV Pier would actually read very highly on that because of the variety of species that you can catch from it the only trouble is you, you get a few people that do fish it but I think the potential if you were, if you had more access to it, more time on it and tried a few different tactics you could certainly get some big sharks off it and uh, I'd be interested in seeing what you get in the early hours of mornings at different times of the year but here Honda is another one which I go back to year after year it's produced, for me, a lot of big specimens and very, very interesting sort of place to fish. And I can get it to myself. I can... <laughs> nothing worse than travelling thousands of miles and finding somebody fishing where you're fishing. But uh, it's certainly another one that I would rate very, very, very highly. I'll, I'll definitely be back there, I guess, in my lifetime. Final question. What do you see as the ultimate shore angling challenge? And are there any limitations on what could potentially be achieved? Well, Curacao is one that I wanted to target primarily because of the big tarpon that they get there. It's very close to, I think it's Venezuela. It's not the, the most safe places to go, I don't believe. And not far behind that, I guess, it, if not in front of that, would be the Jervis Bay, the point which I've, I've had it written down for a, a number of years now to go there, but the situation hasn't been right to go, so hopefully... As I said before, within the next 12 months, I might just tick that box. And I think that probably offers maybe the best quality fish off the shore of anywhere I, I know of. I'm sure that uh, there are other people who would like to catch big shark off the shore, but it's not really on my list of things to do. I, I'd certainly find midwater fish that are going to really challenge me more interesting. Meanwhile, back in the real world, or for most of the year anyway, it's back to reality and the codlings and whitings in Whitley Bay. Oh, God. Yeah. It certainly keeps you interested anyway. It keeps your hand in. I mean, we're getting older. We're all getting older as, as time progresses. But as long as you've got these challenges and certainly by adding the, the competitive element to it, it keeps my interest. I must admit I'm not doing as much pleasure fishing locally, but I spent sort of three months away last year fishing, so... Just watch the space. <laughs> so big game fishing then, over a wide variety of species and venues, need not cost the earth, if you plan things carefully and are willing to put in the time. And hopefully, what you've just given us could potentially save a lot of time and greatly shortcut some of the usual trial and error. And if you do hook up a marlin from the rocks over in Australia, I hope you'll be coming back to us with an addendum to what you've already given us here. My thanks then to Ken Robinson for sharing some of his hard-earned information with us here. Mm -hmm.